So we were in uh, Chapter 10, Modern Aerospace. I think this is our second try at it. We were on the slide that says Modern Civil Aircraft Advancements. And we had just covered biz jets. All right, we just covered biz jets. So now we're going to talk about ballistic parachutes. When I say ballistic parachutes, effectively this means there is a rocket, a solid rocket motor, and it's inside the airplane. And when you pull the handle inside the airplane, it pulls the parachute up and out so it deploys. So this is a picture of an actual deployment when they were doing it for testing. This is a Cirrus. It's a four-seat airplane. It's got about 200 to 250 horsepower. It's got four seats. It's got a glass cockpit, a computerized screen, and it'll do about 150 to 180 miles an hour. They cost between 400 and $500,000 new. But they have what's called an airframe parachute. And when I say airframe, that means they're every, each person, nobody wears a parachute. You don't have to put on a parachute and jump out the door or jump out the window. This parachute is mounted in the back of the airplane. And when you pull the handle, a rocket pulls the parachute up and open. You know, and, and you know they'll say, don't wait until below 1,000 feet. But it'll probably work a little bit less than 1,000 feet. But if you stall the airplane or spin it and you're too stupid, I mean, uh, you're, you don't have the practice to get out of it or you're in the clouds and you think you're going to hit a mountain or you get spatially disoriented and the airplane's going all crazy or the engine quits and it's at night over the mountains, I'd rather hit the ground at 10 or 20 miles an hour going down than fly into the side of a mountain at 100 miles an hour. So if you're flying at night over the mountains, this might be a really good alternative. So there's a lot of airplanes like this. In fact, the Alpha Electros that Reedley College is going to get. These Alpha Electrodes, they have a built-in ballistic parachute system. So a lot of, most airplanes don't have this, okay? Just so you know, most airplanes don't have this. Oh, interestingly enough, this same company, Cirrus, they're making these jets. They've just started, gotten them FA approved, and they're starting to deliver them. It's the first jet business jet that has an air parachute. In fact, I think it's the only one. Of course, it makes the airplane cost more. All right. So, tilt rotors. We, I showed you pictures of the V-22 flown by the Air Force and the Marine Corps. This is the Bell Augusta B, uh, 609. Bell bowed out of the project Augusta. Augusta is a, a helicopter company in Italy. They also team, and maybe they've merged, with West Westland which is a British helicopter company question. Uh, Mo Italian motorcycles. Let's see, there's Ducati and Moto Guzzi. I don't... I, I MV Augusta, I've not heard of it, but that doesn't mean there's no such thing as an MV Augusta motorcycle. But Augusta is a, an Italian aerospace firm, and they've been making helicopters for decades. And they have, been, they have also helped make helicopters with a British manufacturer called Westland to make other helicopters, but I don't know if Westland is involved in this, but it's going to be six or ten people, and it can take off and land, just like the, the that V-22 we looked at. It's just smaller, but this thing's going to cost you $10 million. I mean, not you, and I don't mean me either. I, I don't have, if I had $10 million floating around, I'd be living in Bali or Tahiti, and I'd be drinking those little drinks with the with the umbrellas in it, sitting on the beach with my wife. And I'd go scorb, sc snorkeling and scuba diving, and I'd get me a seaplane and a helicopter and a glider and a powered parachute. All right. Synthetic vision. This is a computer screen, and the blue is water, and the green is the ground. And that's far below you. The yellow is ground far ahead of you that's close to your altitude, but you're going to barely miss it. And the red is the part of the mountains that you're going to hit change if you don't climb. So literally, you can, be, you can be in the clouds. This is what's cool about synthetic vision. You can be in the clouds, and this will tell you where the land, where the ground is. And this doesn't show up. Oh, you can, you can see those, uh, those yellow triangles. That's obstacles. And to the right, way in the right, you can see what looks like red ones. The red ones you're going to hit. 
If you stay at this altitude and turn and aim towards it, you're going to hit it. The yellow ones, you're only one or two or three hundred feet up. Some do. The newer ones do. And that Cirrus, that four-seater with the parachute, you can put this in it. You can put synthetic vision in. You can put, and you can retrofit airplanes. But it's going to, that $20,000 for the glass cockpit, let's add another $10,000. However, what's so awesome, I love the 21st century. Has anybody ever been in the 21st century besides me? A couple of you. Okay, all right, great. Yeah, the 21st century. One thing I love about the 21st century is uh, technology. And you may have heard of a, of a computerized tablet device called an iPad. It's like an iPhone, except it's bigger. Has anybody ever seen an iPad? It's a, depending on the size, they're maybe about a foot in, in diagonal. They make smaller ones and bigger ones. In any case, there are computer programs that go on pads. There are apps, applications. You may not have heard of this. Apps that go on these tablets. And you can navigate. You can get weather, terrain, traffic avoidance, pre-flight planning. And you can get them with synthetic vision. So here's somebody with an iPad. Now, granted, you look at this airplane. This is the Cirrus. This is that airplane that had the parachute. So it's got glass panels. It's got glass cockpit. So the two main screens in the airplane are computer displays. And you notice there's a couple of gauges over here. These are the backup ones in case the main screens fail. But this is an iPad. And it's hard to tell in there, but it actually shows where the runway is. So you could be flying along in this airplane. And you would know where the green, green is good terrain, yellow is caution terrain, and red is the bad terrain. And you can all see that in the iPad. So you, and guess what? You can get an iPad for three or four hundred dollars. And, and it's generating all this ground terrain comes from a database that knows where all the, all the, all the mountains and all the hills and rivers and valleys and all the airports are. And that database is inside of the computer. And it's got a GPS in it, or you have an external GPS that the iPad gets. So it knows where you are, and it knows what direction you're flying. It knows how high you are. So it can display on the screen where all the terrain is and all the obstacles and the runway. So the subscription, so if you, if you want the synthetic vision and you want it to work really, really well, you need to spend three or $400 for an iPad. You spend about 500 or or $1,000 for one extra piece of equipment. And then it's $150 a year for a subscription. Huh? Instead of an extra ten thousand. And you don't have to have you don't have to have computer screens. You can have your nineteen sixty nine Cessna one seventy two K that has the original paint job from nineteen sixty nine. Well, some of it's flaked off and is floating around the United States. But you can have the original instruments from nineteen sixty nine and put your iPad up there. I have mine set up that I put it on the control wheel. I have a clamp that goes on it, and I set it on the control wheel. I actually can get the synthetic vision. It's just that it doesn't tell me if the airplane is banking or not. So actually, if we take off that extra five hundred or thousand, so a three or four hundred dollar iPad and a hundred and fifty dollar subscription, that's what I have. And I have synthetic vision. I just don't use it because I look out the window. But it's really, really nice if you're flying in the clouds. It is sweet. Or if you're flying at night, it is sweet. You, the, you, you, yes, you would want to use that if you were flying at night, but you don't have to use that if you're flying at night. If you, what's that? Oh, the light's bright enough. Yeah, the landing light. You, you're about 150 or 100 feet off the runway. That's why there's lights on the runway, and you fly towards it. And when you get close, you can start saying, "Oh, there's that black asphalt. I think I'll land." It's not that difficult. It's, it's not that difficult. You can land without a landing light. It's a little easier with the landing light. So if you're smart, you're taking flying lessons, you first learn how to do it with the landing light, and then you practice it without, in case it burns out in flight. Burns out in flight. So that's what's awesome. You don't have to have tens of thousands of dollars to have synthetic vision. You can get it cheap. For that extra 500 or a grand, this turns into an attitude indicator. You know that little gauge in the middle of the six-pack? It's blue on top and brown on the bottom. It tells you how much the nose is going up and down and how much you're banking left and right. For that extra 500 to 1,000 bucks, you can have that on this. So if your attitude indicator on the airplane fails, you've got one on your iPad. It's just I don't fly at night much, and I don't fly in the clouds, so I can see out the window.
All right, we're going to get back to that. See, what we have to do today is finish. Because tomorrow is the final exam. Yes. Yeah, we're going to take a quiz. It's just, it's the last aviation history quiz. And, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's every video that I've recorded since the beginning of class, and they're all actually there. For some reason, I have not screwed up as and had operator error and screwed up and failed to record a lecture. I didn't think I would do this well. Because I am an operator and I make errors. So what I'd like to do, actually, while I'm thinking about it, well, well, we'll get to it. We'll come back to these videos if we can. All right, I want to talk about deregulation, the Airline Deregulation Act of 1978. How many people in here want to grow up and be airline pilots? One or two or three or four. Okay, well, then this is important to you because it impacts whether or not you can get a job as an airline pilot. And up to 1978, the federal government, you had to get permission from the federal government. If you wanted to fly an airliner and let people buy tickets to go from Houston to Fresno, you had to get the FAA's permission to do it. And you had to get permission from the government how much you charged. In 1978, yeah, I know, it doesn't say, it sounds kind of weird. In 1978, the, the airlines were heavily regulated. In 78, they said, ah, we're not going to do that anymore. This is a capitalist economic system. Do whatever you want. If you can, if, you can, if the airplane will give you a gate and a place to park an airplane, you can fly there. So the airlines deregulated. Some airlines got better and made more money. Some airlines went out of business because they couldn't cope with it. In any case, this deregulation act of 1978 changed the way airlines did things. And it's still not heavily regulated like it used to be. So they didn't say, this is how much you can charge. Airlines can charge whatever they want. It used to be the airline, the, the, F, the, you'd, the FAA would say, this is how much you get to charge on this flight. And if you're an airline and other two different airlines came out, you had to charge the same amount of money. So the only way you could compete to get customers was have better in-flight food and have flight attendants that were more attractive, than the, or at least have advertisements that showed more attractive flight attendants. And you'll see how I'm not being gender specific. I'm just saying attractive flight attendants. That's all I'm saying. In any case, that's and, and service and free baggage and stuff like that. But it's not the same anymore. Now you want to pay the least amount of money, you fly on Southwest or JetBlue. All right. The, air, the government used to pay airlines to fly into cities like Visalia. Visalia Airport used to have Boeing 737s flying in there. And if there was no air, if the air, if the government wasn't giving them a subsidy, they, the airlines would lose money, and there'd be no air service out of Visalia. Now it's called the called the EAS, the Essential Air Service, but it's not one tenth of what it used to be. So there's a lot less place. Because look, if you live in Visalia, can you drive to Fresno to get on a plane? Yeah. So do you really want the federal government paying an airline to land in Visalia three times a day so five people can get on it per flight? Yeah, I don't want to do that. I say get in your car and drive. It's, but hey, that's me. All right, so not that. So and now I want to talk about the hub and spoke system. The hub and spoke system is set up so that let's see if I can draw here. Oh, there it is. Ta -da. So let's just say for fun that uh, that you're here in Fresno. If you want to get to uh, the middle of Oklahoma here. You're going to have to fly from Fresno to one of these. Uh, why is it doing that? Now I can't even draw. I want to get from Fresno. I'm well. It's not going to let me draw. Okay, I'm not even going to try. We're going to stop talking about the hub and spoke system. I'm not going to ask any questions on the final exam. Okay, it used to be there was pretty much only big airlines with big airliners. But the cost of jets has gone down, and the airlines go, you know what? I want to fly an airplane into Fresno, 
and fly them into San Francisco. So now they'll fly on my airline from San Francisco all the way to New York. So I'm going to fly little smaller airplanes, and I can fill them up and make money with only 50 people instead of flying an airliner in there with 100 and still having 50 people on it. If that airliner is only half full, they lost money on that flight. If it's by airline and a whole bunch of other things, but you usually got to get 60, 70, or 80% of the seats full before that one flight is making money, or at least breaking even. So the introduction of smaller jets has been great. So now we have these regional airlines, and they do the flying from little cities like Fresno. Ha ha, little cities from Fresno to Frisco. And San Francisco is where you get on the big jet airliner, or fly from San Fresno down to L.A., and that's where you get on the big airliner. How many airlines are flying from Fresno to Hawaii? I'd say none. It's because not that many people from Fresno want to go to Hawaii in, on them one day. So what do you do? But a lot of people want to go to L.A. because once you get to L.A. airport, there's a hundred different places you can go. So that's why there's airline service between Los Angeles. So the regional airlines are much, much bigger than they used to be. And the way it works, if you're going to be an airline pilot, that's who you get your first job with after you're done being a flight instructor. To be a co-pilot on an airliner, including a regional jet, you have to have your airline transport pilot certificate, and that's about 1,500 hours and the best way to do it is become a flight instructor and let your students pay to rent the airplane. Yes. Oh, how long would it take to fly from here to L.A.? Well, let's say it's Fresno to L.A. We'll just make up a number. Say it's 200 miles. That's about right. And your jet goes 500 miles an hour. It's a little slower in the climb. So let's say it averages 400 miles an hour. 400 miles an hour, but it's only 200 miles. It's a 30-minute flight. Yeah, but once you get to the airport, you got to fly around and get in line between all the other airplanes. So it's probably going to be 40 or 45 minutes. But if nobody else, yeah, it's better than a four-hour drive. But if nobody was there, you could take off and go straight and not have to mess with the other airplanes. You could go straight and land. You could shave off 10 or 15 of those minutes, which is, yeah. So there's a regional airline. Not all the regional airliners are jets. This is a 50-seater that's got turboprops on it. But we're still talking that's going to be your first job. Either You're probably going to get a job flying after you've been a flight instructor and you want to work for the airlines. You're going to, the littlest thing you're going to fly is probably a 19-seat turboprop. It's got two engines. It's got turbines. It's like this, but it only holds 19 seats. This, uh, I think it's a Saab. I think it holds 50. So it would be about half the size of this. But you get to sit in the front seat. You get to wear the, the airline outfit with the epaulets. And you get to wear the big, gigantic sunglasses. Yeah. All right, so here is a Canada Air regional jet. This will hold 50 people. This is very common. Probably uh, SkyWest probably flies either Canada Air regional jets made out of Canada or Embraer regional jets that are made in, by Embraer in uh, Brazil. Those are the most two common little airliners. Em Embraer regional jets or Canada Air regional jets in the airline business or in the aviation business. We call them CRJs. Canada Air Regional Jet, or ERJ's, Ember Air Regional Jet. And when I say consolidation of the major airlines, some went out of business, Pan Am went out of business, Eastern Airlines went out of business, but a lot of airlines merged or one bought the other, like American Airlines bought Continental Air Airlines. American Airlines actually also bought Transworld Airlines. And if you look, or maybe it was United that bought Continental, I can't remember all those airline mergers. There's less airlines today than there used to be, in particular the big ones. Right now we're talking, if we just talk big ones, it's United, American, Delta, Southwest, you probably would call Alaska a major airline. And then there's about 10 or 10 regional ones. Yeah, question. Where would what? Oh, Emirates Airlines, they're based out of Dubai in the Middle East. And and uh, what was the question about Emirates? Where would it be landing? Uh, the flights from Emirates are going to be into the United States. Effectively, the way the way IKO and the airlines have set it up, or not IKO, the federal, the governments have set it up. IKO is the flying rules. The government, if you want to be an airline and fly into that country, you got to follow IKA rules. That's the flying rules. But you got to get the government's permission. Effectively, you can't fly around back and forth inside the U.S. just so you can carry U.S. citizens. 
if you're a foreign airline, but you can land in Florida on your way to Hawaii, and you can offload people in Florida. You can pick up U.S. citizens in Florida or anybody else, and then take off and then keep going to Hawaii because it's an international flight. Does that make sense? So that's why if you're looking for something and you're looking for a flight from Fresno to Houston, the foreign Mexico is not there, and neither is Emirates. But if I said I want to fly from Fresno to o the state of Oaxaca, or is it Oaxaca? If I want to go to Oaxaca, does anybody know a city in Oaxaca? Okay, I want to go to the state of Mexico called Oaxaca, and we want to go to an Aer Aero Mexico can fly from Fresno to San Diego and then to o Oaxaca. But it's got to be part of an international flight. Okay, am I making sense there? If I've been on Aeromex, you know, I went to Cabo San Lucas, but I don't think it was Aeromexico. I've been in China, and we flew on some Chinese airlines. So here's the number of airlines. Look what happened right here in 1980. This is the number of airlines in the United States. Woohoo! So here's 19, here's 1978 when uh, when uh, when airline deregulation. So airlines got oh yeah, let's more airlines. Let's make money. We're not deregulated. Oh, let's go out of business. I hate that. And Hayes words what's great. Air, in the modern aerospace, aviation safety keeps getting better and better in general. When was the last time you heard of an airline in the United States killing everybody on board? It's been seven or eight, nine years. So avi aviation safety in the airline business is extremely good, not just in the United States. It's just fantastic in the United States. And there are several other countries that are as good as the United States. But we don't not, but it's because the FAA, the National Transportation Safety Board, investigates accidents, and the uh, FAA writes rules. And airlines figure out it's more expensive to pay off the dead people's relatives than it is to change their ways and operate safer. So number of fatalities. Now, granted, this only goes up to 2010. Whoops. This is number of fatalities, but look at that. From 1970, here's 1970, it's been going down to 2010. Holy crap, that's almost half. In 2010, the number of fatalities on an airliner was about half of what it was, we'll say, in the mid-1970s. Holy mackerel. And more people have been flying. And there's more flying being done. Question? So there's even more flying being done, and we're killing less people. I think that's awesome. I hate it when I kill people. Well, I think I would. I've never actually done that, so I'm just guessing that I wouldn't like it. So the things that have changed in civil airliners are ex a lot more big old honking wide airplanes. Like the 787, the 767, the 747, the Airbus A380, extra wide body. So here's there's the 747, very nice pictures. There's the, I think that's the Dash 8 on top. The hump on the top of the airplane is twice as big as it used to be. We already talked about carbon fiber in the 787. That's actually part of a fuselage for a Boeing 787. Most of the airplane structure is made out of carbon fiber and epoxy resin. We're not going to talk about high bypass turbofans, but essentially, the bigger the diameter of the fan, the more fuel efficient it is. The bigger that, that's why if you look at older airline engines are small diameter, and the newer and newer they get, the engine looks bigger. Well, the engine itself that's producing power may not be bigger, but the fan, which is very similar to a propeller, the fan gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And passenger entertainment systems. Man, I flew to China. Without paying a nickel, I could watch about 10 or 12 different movies and 5 or 10 different TV channels and a bunch of music. Literally, I was on an airplane, and there was a TV screen in front of every single seat. And I was in coach. I was in economy. My boss is smart. He's not going to pay for me to sit in first class. I went to China on a business trip. Ask me about it sometime. In-flight Wi-Fi, yeah, that's right. You can use your cell phone in flight Wi-Fi. I won't go into the, how that works. But here, you can see this is the antenna right here on top. Whoops, on top of the Southwest Airlines flight. That's this thing right there. That's the that's the satellite internet coming down from satellites 
That's the antenna pointed up at the satellites so there can be Wi-Fi inside there. And we're not even going to talk about ETOPS because it's too late. And there, of course, is security people. All right, so, so this is what we're going to do. Since we only have 35 minutes to take the test tomorrow, we're going to come in and take the quiz first. So we'll come in and take the quiz on Chapter 10, first thing. I thought I'd get done. Obviously, I'm telling too many stories. Nobody asked me, Mr. Constant, would you stop telling so many stories? I want you to cover the material in the lecture notes. So I'm not going to give you that responsibility.